was who you have met, Andrew Berry. He's from Harvard University. He's teaching there. And he's a geneticist uh, and uh, an evolutionary biologist. Or at least, I think he's an evolutionary biologist. <laughs> 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 I hope I you do. find this reassuring. I do as well. Yes, so we're on the same page, page on this yeah, one. Yes. That's good. And uh, he's been coming to Sabancı University since the very, very beginning. It's over 14 years that he's coming every year. And um, now, uh, and he's been teaching part of the NS102. And uh, now he's going to tell us about. Um, how antimicrobial resistance develops uh, from an evolutionary perspective. Um, and also, this will be, as far as I'm concerned, a very good complementation to what we have just done in NS101 uh, in the antibiotic resistance module. So you hope we, it'll be yes, a good complement. It might and be just repeating we stuff. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> that maybe. You live in hope. Yes, and uh, and we thank Andrew very much for this contribution, and I hope you will, you will all enjoy it. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Zara. And first of all, um, for those of you who don't know me, I do. It's an absolute privilege to be involved with Savanja University now, as Zara mentioned, for quite a while uh, from the beginning. Um, I think the. Curriculum you guys are developing is fantastic. I think the students, not all of them, obviously, um, are fantastic. Um, it's a wonderful learning environment, and as I say, it's a real privilege to be involved. Um, I should add, too, um, that one of the reasons I like to come back to Sabanji every year, um, basically when the weather gets nice, that's because I've arrived. It's a simple cause and effect. Um, uh, is you do happen to live, well, actually you guys, because you live on campus, don't live in it, but you do live close to the greatest city in the universe. Um, and I have to say, it's a privilege every year to come and visit Istanbul. I love being here, and I love working with you guys. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, now, I'm going to talk. I gave a slightly weird title, um, Evolutionary Approaches to Exploring and I've used antimicrobial, not antibiotic per se, because I want to expand, partly because the examples, are, some of the examples I want to talk about are from eukaryotic parasites, such as plasmodium, uh, the malaria parasite. But the problem is the same, and you're all completely familiar with it. And you might even ask, you know, why do we have a separate lecture? What we're talking, the whole thing is about evolution, right? I mean, this is the canonical example of natural selection in action, and it's an incredibly simple idea. My friend here, New York Hill figure, that's what he has written to identify himself, um, gets a bacterial disease. He is, he is being colonized by 100 billion microbes, bacteria, right? Happily living in him, compromising him, sucking the strength out of him, sucking the nutrients out of him. I had that population of 100 billion microbes with an antibiotic which kills them. <laughs> right? You're feeling better. It kills them all except for one. Okay? Serendipitously, and we'll talk about this in a moment, whether it's a spontaneous mutation, a new mutation, or part of the standing crop of, mer of, of genetic variation in the population. Maybe, okay, let's take a simple example. It's a mutation which impairs a pathway that is involved in importing material from outside the cell into the cell. So, in fact, normally that mutation is deleterious. It's a bad mutation to have, right? Because it's impairing my ability as a microbe to bring in the stuff that I need from outside the cell into the cell. But suddenly, it's the best possible mutation on the planet, right? Because I'm not importing the poisonous antibiotic, whatever it is, right? Um, but what does that mean? That means, yes, we've killed off 100 billion minus one cells in New York Hill figure here, right? But what's going to happen? The entire subsequent population of microbes in New York Hill figure are going to be derived from the one. 
Okay? These are bacteria, people. They breed and multiply pretty damn efficiently. Okay? So suddenly you have an explosive increase in population size of the one. And what do you got? You now have a population, as I say, there's no mysteries here. You now have a population that is resistant to antibiotics. It's an extremely well attested phenomenon. And by the way, it doesn't only apply to antibiotics. The other area, of course, it's very pervasive in is in pesticides. So you're trying to kill an insect which is eating your crops. Fine. You can dump some poison on it. All you're doing effectively is asserting very strong natural selection. Super strong natural selection. Remember, one in 100 billion survive, but that's enough. You're doing that if you're dumping, if there's some insect that's eating your, your corn plants. Same thing. So this is something that's so. I'm an evolutionary biologist, as Sarah said. Um, I love natural selection. It's a beautiful process. It's made us what we are. It's made the natural world what it is. It's this extremely powerful shaper of biological destinies. But it's also a bastard. That's what we're talking about here. Because it means that as we try and control New York Hilfiger, in Portland, New York Hilfiger is now dying, by the way. You're looking at a corpse here because that resistant uh, beast took over. We couldn't kill it. It killed. That's just a dead person sitting in front row. Um, it, it's combating our efforts to control disease. It's combating our efforts to control pests in crop production. It's combating no end of human effort, if you like, to control the natural environment. Every time we try and control the natural environment, whether it's inside us or in a cornfield, natural selection intervenes and takes it away from us. Okay? So in a sense, and this is just preamble, you're saying, so why? We've been talking about this in NS101. You guys have been talking about this process, and you've been picking it apart and dealing and understanding the mechanism and so on. Why do we need somebody, an evolutionary biologist, to come and tell us more about something we already basically understand. As I say, this isn't rocket science, okay? It's a very simple and powerful idea. Um, uh, the answer is I'm going to try and put three particular spins on antimicrobial resistance, which I, again, I don't know. And <laughs> I'll just see if Janan stays, stays away, um, see whether these are a new departure from what you've been talking about, which explicitly use evolutionary approaches to understand the history and origins of these outbreaks. But I just want to do a little preamble, and this is going to be old news for the NS101 people, um, but for the NS102 people, this will be useful information. And for the nice to see Tevitol here. Hi, guys. Um, this is a recent table. And it's extraordinary, actually, um, of uh, these are the dates. So penicillin was discovered earlier, but only really went into sort of reasonable production. This was the first antibiotic, antibiotic in the sense that something we can use medically to kill uh, pernicious microbes. So this is the timeline of introducing new antibiotics. That's on the right. That's the good news, folks. The bad news is on the left. This is the, uh, the first reports of resistance, basically, and you'll see, it comes a few years after. In this case, actually, we had, um, before penicillin was widely available, we already knew there were penicillin-resistant uh, bacteria out there. This is testimony to the power and efficacy of natural selection. So I'm just going to spool it past. And as I say, it's slightly depressing. Because every time you think, hey, look, meth methicillin, yeah! Look, bang, 62, methicillin-resistant staphylococcus, OK? Um, I just want to make the general point that basically whatever we introduce is turned into toast, if you like, by natural selection, by the evolution of antibiotic 
resistance. Uh, it's a huge, huge issue today medically. You're all probably familiar with these so-called superbugs, which are not just resistant to the, the standard, so your penicillins, your amoxicillins, and so on, but have even developed resistance to the more uh, recently acquired uh, antibiotics. So you've got these, these really nasty things, which are virtually impossible to kill. Okay? Uh, so that's problem one. Problem two is this, and again, I'm sure the NS101 kids have discussed this in some detail. This is the number of antibacterial, uh, um, antibacterial drugs which have been approved. This is in the US, but it's a fair proxy. This is starting in 1980, okay? This is 2012. Um, so you're dealing with, a, so w as we have an increasing problem in terms of increasing a more pervasive resistance, <laughs> So we're getting a corresponding decline in the rate that we're, we're bringing new products, new antibiotics to market. Now, there are a number of, was that, have you just coughed some nasty resistant? <laughs> are you doing, is this an experiment, Donna? Um, um, bless you. Um, uh, the, the, and there are multiple factors. One is obviously, Discovery, once you've discovered the, the easy ones, discovery becomes more difficult, okay? That's the first uh, point. So you have to invest more time, more money, more effort to discover more useful antibiotics. But the other thing, and this is an interesting economic problem, if I'm a drug company and I'm investing in creating a new drug, I create an antibiotic. Look, I, fine, new antibiotic. It's taken a long time to discover it. It's taken a lot of chemical synthesis to develop it and so on, but finally I've made it. I'm going to give it to New York Hilfiger. He's going to take it for five days, and he's better. He says, thanks very much. Okay? Now imagine, this is going to be a bit personal. New York Hilfiger, can you handle it? Yeah. Okay. Let's say I'm uh, also, I have the choice. I can either spend the money to develop that, which New York Hilfiger is going to use for five days, or I can develop a drug used for sexual dysfunction in men, okay? Which New York Hilfiger, who's 20 today, and he's going to live until 70, is going to use one of those every night for the next 50 years, okay? No, I mean, sorry, I did warn you, New York Hilfiger. Um, um, uh, it's a no-brainer, right? I get five days of drug sales out of an antibiotic, I've got 50 times 365 days of sales on the alternative product, okay? So that, that a big part of this problem is simple economics uh, of the pharmaceutical industry. This is a recent, from a recent review, don't worry with a huge block of text, um, uh, reviewing, so this is 2010, uh, reviewing the state of play in terms of uh, antibiotic resistance and antibiotic uh, development. Um, uh, so here's, this was the, 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 the so pre-antibiotics, which they've described as the dark ages. So there was this famous moment in the history of medicine where a man called Semmelweis solved the problem of what was called puer puerperal fever in, I think, a Viennese hospital. This is in the, in the early, uh, in, the 19, in the 1800s, um, which was that women were frequently dying of infections after childbirth in hospitals, and it was because there just there was infected material being transmitted on the hands of the um, doctors involved in the medical in the birth process, or the doctors and the nurses. So, Mr. Semmelweis invented the brilliant idea of washing your hands. Okay, <laughs> um, and now that's trivial, but. Brilliantly life-saving. This is basic hygiene that he's instituted. The, that was before antibiotics. Then we had antibiotics. We didn't need hygiene because you could just kill whatever was creating a problem with a good slug of antibiotic. Uh, the tragedy is we've gone through this phase, relatively low production of new antibiotics, increasing, ramping up, and I'm sure you've discussed in MS101 some of the reasons why antibiotic resistance has spread so rapidly, partly because of poor use and poor application of antibiotics. But you're, so you're seeing an increase 
in resistance and a decrease in production of new antibiotics such that this review sort of says despondently maybe we're back to Semmelweis you know the best we can do antibiotics have been effectively useless the best we can do is wash our hands okay um, yeah as I say a somewhat demoralizing prospect what I'm going to talk about is say there are three things I want to talk about and again my hope is this will be sufficiently specific that the NS101 people won't just say oh god seen it all before um, three things which are very explicit in their evolutionary content one is where does this resistance come from what, are the, what is the origin the evolutionary origin of resistance two can we use evolutionary tools the, the tools of population genetics to hunt down and identify the actual loci i.e. the genetic sites of action at which the particular mutations have occurred which endow the bug, the super bug with the, the resistance. Okay? And I'll talk a little bit about why this is absolutely critical we do this um, and, and promises with better understanding of how resistance is conferred gives us a, a huge leg up in terms of the ability to fight resistance. And finally, I'm going to try and end positively. It's very difficult to end positively when we're talking about the evolution of uh, antibiotic resistance because it is a pretty much a civil voice. All right, let's just wash our hands. Um, doom and gloom scenario. I want to suggest that the structure of organisms and their genomes and the way in which genes interact with each other in a sense is grounds for hope. Okay, so I'm going to try and finish upbeat. Everyone is going to go off to pizza smiling. Um, but let's start with origins. Uh, and this is somewhat surprising. I mean, look, you know the basic idea. You've got, um, we've got New York um, here suffering from his infection. We're going to dump um, the antibiotic into him. And the mutations are going all the time. Mutations are a thermodynamic inevitability in DNA replication, and most of them occur, they're mistakes in copying DNA, okay? So you're, you've got all this bacterial reproduction, what does that mean? Each time you do that, that's replicating the entire bacterial genome. Yeah, you do that with super high fidelity, but mistakes are made, okay? And one in 100,000 of those mistakes, let's say, happens to do something benefit. Maybe, as, let's take the example I gave you, it screws up that import transmembrane pathway in such a way that that individual is not affected by the antibiotic, okay? So that's the standard model of where resistance came from. And then we have, and again, the NS101, people will know about this. It turns out that if I have a mutation, it's pretty much true to say the only people who are going to have experience of that mutation are my children and their children and their children. In other words, we have vertical transmission of genetic material pretty uniformly in a, in, a, in a fairly large and complex organism such as myself. Bacteria have all sorts of ways of shuffling DNA instead of vertically from mum to junior to junior to junior to junior, okay? Doing it horizontally from mum to Auntie Sally and Auntie Joan and then Uncle Frank and so on. Um, some of that's plasmid mediated, those are little loops of DNA, so extra chromosomal loops of DNA which can be passed from one bacterium quite easily to another. And often there will be the, the key mutations, the, anti the antibiotic resistance mutations on these little plasmids. Also, bacteria have this unpleasant habit of just sucking up DNA from the environment and which is found lying around. You know, New York Hilfiger dies, okay? But there's some resistant, uh, and there's a whole bunch of resistant uh, bacteria there. Um, I'm another bacteria that's just walking past. Some of that DNA is spilled out. I suck it up. Now it's in my genome. I'm resistant. Okay? So horizontal transfer is a big part of the story in terms of the, the, the spread of resistance from one population uh, to the next. Uh, turns out, however, look, that happens. Don't get me wrong. Turns out, however, there's a much more interesting evolutionary story to antibiotic resistance than that. 
which is it's old. Antibiotic resistance massively predates the human application of antibiotics. This is an extraordinary cave, the Lechuguilla cave in New Mexico. It's enormous. I know these, these are gypsum crystals, and this is a bloke, right? Just some extraordinary place. It's deep. It's only been recently explored. It's one of the great caves of the world. And like all cave systems, there are all sorts of bacteria which live deep, deep down there. Okay? And so if you're an adventurous microbiologist, you can go down there and sample that bacteria. Now, that bacteria has been down there hundreds of thousands of years. Certainly hasn't been hanging out in hospitals, right, picking up antibiotic-resistant plasmids, these little loops of DNA <coughs> from, from other bacteria. These have been isolated from human and therefore human-mediated uh, antibiotic contact for, well, living in co the complete isolation, the claim is for four million years. You take those strains of bacteria, you culture them in a petri dish, and you dump antibiotics on them. A bunch of you, you go to a, a, a pharmacy and you take your favorite antibiotics. A large proportion of those naive bacteria are resistant to those antibiotics. In other words, there is a very high endogenous level of antibiotic resistance in natural bacteria populations. And it arose way back when, not in 1940 when, 1943 when penicillin first appeared on the market. Okay? Another, so that's from the deep caves. This is a cool paper. This is a nature paper from a couple of years ago. Um, what they did was, this is a slice of permafrost from Alaska, okay? Um, well, actually in the Yukon, sorry. So this is nor very far north of Canada. Um, and you find all sorts, so you, you're traveling back in time. They are confident they've got material from about 30,000 years ago, okay? So this is a time machine that you can travel, dig down, and you're finding material which was deposited 30,000 years ago. You can find, so you can find bacteria which have been literally frozen in the permafrost uh, for 30,000 years. And you can look at their genomes, sequence their genomes. Do they have evidence of antibiotic resistance? Yes. Okay? So, and 30,000 years ago, nobody was using penicillin, right, when they got a bad fever. Um, so, these results show conclusively that antibiotic resistance is a natural phenomenon that predates the modern selective pressure of clinical antibiotic use. And again, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying this is unimportant. Obviously, the selection pressure, uh, pressure of modern clinical antibiotic use is enormous and significant. What it, all I'm emphasizing is these, many of these are, quote, old mutations that have been around for a long time. This is a paper which is published this week um, in Current Biology. This is, uh, and again, the details are unimportant. Turns out there are certain signatures. When you scan across a bacterial genome, there's certain signatures of uh, antibiotic resistance you can identify in the genome. They have some silly term for it. Uh, transferable antibiotic resistance gene determinants. Anyway, um, uh, these things are well analyzed because they're important. So people analyze uh, bacteria from hospitals and so on. They're looking for these things. Turns out, if you're fine, forget about hospitals. Forget about nursing homes. Forget about public toilets. Let's go into the natural environment. Let's go into forests. Let's go into the ocean. Let's go into the deep soil. Do we find evidence in the genomes that we take from these regions of these ARGDs? Absolutely, yes. So this study um, uh, had past, they, they, they had 71 different environments, so you know, <coughs> shallow ocean, deep ocean, and so on and so forth. Every single one. It's not like there's something peculiar about soil, for example, that produces antibiotic resistance. No, it's a feature of microbial communities wherever you find them. So, hello, why are bacteria 30,000 years ago in the permafrost, why bacteria in every environment on the planet, why are they 
resistant to antibiotics when they're not encountering. They're not in hospitals, not dealing with old New York hill figure here, right? What's going on? Well, there are multiple reasons, um, and these are just some. Um, so I've said, but why in the absence of human application of antibiotics should bacteria be uh, resistant? Um, well, the first point is uh, bacteria, just like the rest of us, remember how natural selection works. Natural selection is about competition. It's about um, being better than your neighbors, getting access to the resources. Uh, bacteria have problems with their neighbors, just as we have problems with our neighbors. Okay? We have problems with lions. Okay? So we have spears to kill them. Okay? That's a defense mechanism. What do bacteria do if they've got nasty bacteria living next door to them? They produce antibiotics. Okay? An antibiotic writ large is just something that kills microbes. Okay? So in other words, this is a defense strategy of bacteria is to produce substances which kill other bacteria. Okay? So what does that mean? Remember how natural selection works. It's almost inevitably a uh, escalation, a arms race. Okay. So Ferrari here is my neighbouring bacterium. He's pumping out toxic. I, I, I'm living here. He's living there. He's pumping some toxic toxin out here to try and kill me, so that he can get all the resources in the environment. <coughs> okay. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to evolve the ability to resist that. Ha ha! Ha ha! Come on, come on, keep pumping it up. So I've just evolved antibiotic resistance. The antibiotic was being produced by my neighboring bacterium, but I, and I've evolved the ability to handle it, right? For, for good competitive reasons. So that's the same. Some of their competitors have evolved ways to resist those molecules. And this is the, the obvious one. Ferrari here is producing a poison to poison me, right? But he's obviously got a bit of an issue. He doesn't want to poison himself. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm going to kill you. <laughs> um, so um, one of the best places to find antibiotic resistance in bacteria is in the bacteria that produce the antibiotics. So a famous <coughs> example of this is this baby, vancomycin. This was a, uh, a fairly recent um, antibiotic, um, and it was suddenly with a sudden very massive increase in resistance. Where did that resistance come from? Turns out, now it's been shuffled around by horizontal gene transfer, so that it's being very efficiently transferred. But where did it come from? It came from this very organism that made it the stuff in the first place. Okay, and this was this. So this is the self-defense mechanism um, that we had with Ferrari here. Okay, so that's point number one, and it's a very depressing point. It is essentially Yuki. You are stunningly late, <laughs> um, and you missed the best bit. It's all downhill from now on. <laughs> um, uh, it's a sort of demoralizing picture, right? So almost certainly, whatever we choose to throw at bacteria, there's a solution already out there, OK? Um, uh, yes, it's a matter of time. You know, it wasn't so that resistance to vancomycin didn't happen instantly because it has to be passed from the vancomycin resistance source into the populations which we're trying to kill in our patients in, in New York, Hilfiger, and so on. Um, uh, but the bottom line, we should be aware of this, right? That we can't probably come up with an antibiotic, which, or at least not a naturally derived antibiotic, um, for which there is not an already existing natural solution. So, second thing I want to talk about is this business, um, hunting the culprit loci. So let's take that example of vancomycin. What are the genomic changes, the particular genetic changes, obviously, which then create uh, changes in physiology, metabolism, whatever it is, that confer resistance? Um, and why do we care? Well, the first reason is a very practical one. If we can identify the mutation, okay, which, which 
allows us, which prevents the effective use of vancomycin. Okay, uh, and let's say, well, here's poor old New York Hilfiger's. You know, he's going downhill fast. He's in intensive care. Um, the question is, should I use vancomycin? <coughs> okay, it's going to be useless. Maybe I, so. I don't know whether the bacteria that's infecting him is resistant. So one thing I can do is take some of the bacteria, culture it out, um, and then test. You know, put some vancomycin on it. That takes so long, he's going to be dead. Sorry about that. Um, uh, no, much more efficiently is to do. If I know the mutation, I can just take some of the bacteria out of him, um, do a PCR basic molecular biology protocol to identify whether that mutation is present or not. Bang, I've got my results. Okay? So knowing um, the identity of the specific mutations which cause uh, antibiotic resistance is really useful in terms of treatment and so on. And by the way, it might be a whole population is resistant. Maybe, it, it, maybe we're dealing with malaria in Africa and we find out that the entire population of plasmodium, which is the thing that causes malaria in Nigeria, is resistant to a particular anti-plasmodium agent. But how do I find that out? This way. Okay, I go, I, I, yes, I can culture things and take ages about it, um, which is costly and labor intensive, or I can go the molecular genetics route. But this is the biggie. The identification of the causal mutations provides a means to delineate mechanisms of drug action and can suggest ways in which drugs may be modified to restore efficacy. If we know mechanistically how resistance has arisen, then we're in a position to, if you like, maybe second guess resistance, to do a run around, to beat resistance. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute. The, th the third one is. Um, this also giving it that genetic basis resistance provides the tools we need ultimately, and this is the long-term goal, to really understand the process whereby these changes occur and how they spread through the population and so on. So, you know, ultimately the long-term goal, the long-term goal is to be able to introduce antibiotics which somehow do not engender resistance. But we need to understand how resistance works if we can do that. So, so, so far as I'm concerned, this is the important one. That if we've identified the culprit that's causing the antimicrobial uh, resistance, um, we can then maybe come up with a strategy to deal with this. Okay? And, and, and again, I assume that NS101 uh, people know about this. It's a kind of a cool story. Um, Beta lactam antibiotics were, quote, the original antibiotics. Uh, penicillin is one of them. Uh, and don't worry with the uh, Wikipedia derived graphics. Um, uh, this, or the point is this thing, this is our antibiotic, comes in and it messes up cell wall formation in, um, in bacteria. Okay, so that's its mechanism of action. Uh, there is a counter action on the part of the bacteria. This is uh, uh, antibiotic resistance where an enzyme called beta-lactamase, and there are all sorts of different forms of beta-lactamase, um, uh, essentially breaks apart that bit of the antibiotic which was active in terms of inhibiting the formation of cell walls. Okay, so we understand mechanistically how this works. We understand that the problem is beta-lactamase, okay? And we also understand, by the way, and this is a sobering figure, these are different beta-lactamase enzymes identified post-1970. So there were a handful. Now, this is partly an acetamate bias. We're much better at identifying them now, but it's also an index. Of, that we're now on the order of 900 different evolution evolutions of beta-lactamase inhibition or oh, sorry, beta-lactamate beta evolution uh, in the era of antibiotics, okay? Now, but the cool thing is we, are, we have a decent understanding of what's going on here, okay? We need the beta-lactam in there to do its anti uh, antibiotic work, and the beta-lactamase is screwing that up, okay? So we need to, it's okay, fine. 
we need to screw up the beta lactamase. And we can do that. Turns out there is a inhibitor of beta lactamase, the enzyme, um, which is uh, it's called clavulanic acid. And don't ask me what that is. Ask John. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so this is, and I, uh, this rings a bell because I've fed this stuff to my children when they've had bad fevers. Um, um, this is where, so this is, it's a prescription called Augmentin, which is two drugs. One is amoxicillin, which is a beta-lactam operating antibiotic, a bit like penicillin, okay? But two, it comes with clavulanic acid. So you are inhibiting the action of the inhibitor, so to speak, uh, the beta-lactamase enzyme, okay? So to a certain extent, I think this is the future, okay? It's smart, multi-pronged drug administration. But in order for this to be the future, this is, we could only do this courtesy knowing an awful lot about where the resistance in this system, the beta-lactamase, came from, okay? So there's a lot of science before you can get to this stage. And it's that science that I want to talk about right now. So there are multiple ways in which we can identify the kilocyte. Okay, I want to give you one example which really draws upon the evolutionary processes underpinning that. So, so for example, um, in this case, you know, how do we go and identify a particular beta-lactamase locus? I'm going to talk in this example about this. You've all had this experience? Uh, you know, sometimes it's at night. Why is it they insist? What is it with my ears? Uh, anyway, yes, this is Anopheles, the um, mosquito that bears malaria. This is probably a massive underestimate. This is huge, folks. 219 million cases of malaria in 2010, uh, and over half a million people dead, mainly children, because they're more susceptible um, to malaria. Um, and as you know, there are two bad boys in this story. Um, one is the mosquito, which is the vector transferring the parasite, which is, uh, and there's several in the genus Plasmodium. The really, the, the worst one is Plasmodium falciparum. That's the one which is most likely to kill you in terms of malaria. Um, so, uh, oh, and this is, there it is in your bloodstream. These are your red blood cells. That's plasmodium. Um, now, there's a long history, so um, long history of uh, trying to cope with plasmodium. One of the things which actually uh, is quite an effective anti-malarial is quinine, uh, which is a, a component of tonic water, which is why my British ancestors um, all drank huge quantities of gin and tonic. Okay, so you go off um, and plague some poor local people in their hot part of the world um, and drink gin and tonics in an attempt to avoid getting malaria. Didn't always work. Um, all I really want you to get from this is we've had multiple phases of initial success. It's the same story as with the uh, standard antibiotics um, like penicillin. Uh, initial success followed by the evolution of resistance. Uh, this is chloroquine. That was in the 1930s. Um, and that has really tailed off big time. Then we had this um, next therapy. Again, worked well, uh, but again, very fast resistance. Uh, the current uh, therapies, many of them based actually around an old Chinese remedy based on a plant called artemisin. Uh, uh, these work pretty well still, but there is resistance. Resistance has been found to these, these are the latest uh, kinds of drugs being used. Resistance has been found in the Malay uh, Thailand border, which is where traditionally uh, resistance has arisen. So I'm going to focus on this. This is the most recent, sort of well worked out case of resistance. And I'd like to show you how, and this was actually just sort of one of multiple approaches, how we can use the footprint of evolutionary processes to identify the specific locus involved. Okay, so plasmodium has a big genome. All right? 
what we've got is we've got populations which have very more or less complete resistance and other populations where it's just creeping up. Okay? Yes, we could sequence lots and lots of genomes and ask what's the difference. That's kind of labor intensive and there's so many differences you'd need an enormous amount of data to actually come up with that and usefully identify what you're doing. What I'm going to advocate <coughs> is using the dynamics of natural selection itself to identify the key regions of a genome. And the logic is shown in this slide. So, and sorry, it's, it's sort of pretty, but it's not great. Um, what we have here, this is a population with no resistance. Okay, this is a population of plasmodium. What we're looking at here is a stretch of a chromosome. Okay, that's just a piece of DNA. Okay, and this, each one is one individual. Okay, so that's individual one, individual two, individual three, and so on. Okay, now, what are all these different colors? These are points in the genome where within the population there is genetic variability. Okay? So this, in, uh, say, uh, this is position 19 along this chromosome. These, this individual has a T, this individual has a T, this individual has a T, this one has a C, this one has a C, this is a T, and so on and so forth. Okay? Um, and this is what we call neutral genetic variation. It's of no consequence. Okay? And it's all mixed up, so, you know, and these are all separate such sites, okay? Now, this is when the excitement starts. Here is the mutation which is going to give us resistance, okay? So what's going to happen? Well, that's going to increase in frequency, isn't it? Because those individuals, the plasmodium, which have the star mutation, are going to survive the uh, application of the antimicrobial, of whatever it is, okay? So what does that mean? Well, this is going to increase in frequency, and it's going to do so very fast. Now, that probably means that there's not enough time for recombination, genetic recombination to occur between our star site and other places in the region. Now, what does that mean? Okay. Well, look at this. This is a population where this sweep is halfway finished. Here we have one, two, three, four, we have eight different sequences, right? Each one is slightly different at these variable sites, okay? What do we have here? We have, still have four of them, but these are all the same. Because there hasn't been enough time for recombination to occur between the flanking regions, so what you've done is simply swept up the key mutation and it's carried along. The term we use is hitchhiking, actually. All this stuff here, this stuff here has hitchhiked as this has increased in frequency, okay? But what does that mean when you look at the variability in this population? It means you sequence eight alleles and you variable one, variable two, variable three, variable four, variable five, variable five, variable five, variable five. In other words, you're getting lots of the same piece of DNA. Now, we can plot this Graphically, this is real data. Um, this is a chunk of chromosome, okay? Now, this is a particular locus, which we'll come back to in a moment. Uh, and this is the distance from it. So this is bang here. That's where this locus sits. Now, I'm not, obviously, this isn't a random locus. This is the locus of interest. This turns out to be the locus that is key in terms of... Uh, causing antimicrobial resistance. So what do we see here? This is the level of variation, okay? This is, there's virtually no variation. Why? Because it's been swept up in frequency. You've got this whole block, again, of the chromosome, which is the same through hitchhiking, okay? So you've got hitchhiking through this region, and as you get further away, so you've had recombination events, so you've got mixed up and put on the rest of the <coughs> genetic variation. So what we can do is we, and this is really cool, we can use this population dynamic process to identify the regions in the genome which are under strong selection because the regions which are strong selection don't have any genetic variability. Okay? There's our baby. Okay? Third thing I want to talk about, and this is the 
feel good about things, walk into the future, held, held, head held high, feeling better about things, is I'm going to talk about pleiotropy. Oh, God, that was in genetics somewhere in NS101. Pleiotropy. pleiotropy is when a single gene has multiple effects. Okay? So think about it. You have 20,000 genes. That's nothing in terms of, ge ge I mean, this is a super, who are, what's your name? Jokalp. 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 Say it louder. Jokalp. Jokalp? Yeah. More or less. Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> this is guy with his funny name. Okay. <laughs> 20,000 genes is actually a tiny amount um, of information, and I'm talking information theory sense here, to generate something as spectacularly com complex here. An extraordinary brain, lots of different tissues, trillions of cells, okay? Just 20,000 bits of information. What does that mean? That means that each one of those bits of information, each gene, <coughs> is involved in a staggering array of processes. It's involved in interacting with other genes. It's the proteins it produces interact with different proteins. Those proteins interact with DNA. They interact with RNA. They're creating large complexes of multi protein complexes, okay? So almost inevitably, every piece of information in the genome is being multi-purposed. And here's a, this is, for example, just to give you a sense of that, this is a Arabidopsis, this is the, the, the fruit fly of the plant world. It's a boring little plant. Um, and here we've got 1,500 genes with 22,000, these are just things that should be measured. And I don't, don't, there's nothing to get out of this except it's bleh, right? Super messy. This is an older plot, which is a bit easier, because you can actually see some of the connections. Um, here we've got 7,000 proteins and 20,000 interactions, and this is in Drosophila. But you get the general idea is every gene, every protein is embedded in a range of processes. Now, this is the cool thing. I mean, think about it. Inevitably, that is going to constrain evolution. Why? Let's say I'm a gene which is involved in, well, say 15 different protein-protein interactions. And remember, this is an estimate. This is just what's been measured, and this, by the way, is in yeast. Details are unimportant, okay? Um, now, let's say evolution is causing me to change in a particular direction. For this function, now I'm performing lots of functions, but this is a particularly important function at the moment, okay? It's pushing me to produce a more hydrophilic protein, okay? That's being favored by natural selection. That's fine for that function, but remember there are 14 other functions that I'm performing, and maybe being hydrophilic is a disaster for those, okay? So the more interaction a piece of DNA has or a protein has, the more problem it is when you start changing it, okay? And this is a crude measure of that. This is the number of interactions, so few, many, and this is the rate of evolution. Just a, a count looking at how many differences accumulate over time. And the more interactions you have, the slower you evolve. So that makes sense, right? You can't mess with something which is really tied into lots of networks. So the result is something we call trade-off. If you, I'm going to change something in this function, it's going to create problems over here, right, in other functions. And we can do, and these are really cool studies. Um, I won't dwell on them, but we can now disentangle the actual pathways in which resistance evolves. So this is a, a beta-lactam situa beta lactamase situation um, showing, and they're one, two, three, four, five mutations uh, starting, and this is with none of the mutations, and this with all five mutations, okay? Um, and all I want you to get out of this is, and they've, by the way, they've made every permutation and tested to see um, its characteristics, okay? And you get an enormous, this is 0 0.009 Sorry, 0 0.09 resistant. This is 4,100 4, resistant. So you're dealing with orders of magnitude change in resistance courtesy of these five uh, changes. 
What we can see is not all changes are equal. You would have thought, oh, you just need to get those five anyway. It doesn't matter. Just get them, get them, get them. No. Only a few paths will actually work. The green one is the most heavily used one. So the journey through, if you like, design space in evolution is convoluted. And this is a function of trade-off, because if you mess with something in a particular order, you're going to screw up something else. We can see this also with malaria. This is the same gene we talked about before, okay? Um, and this is a very similar study, except here we've got only four, so we're going from, this is a, a, accumulating four different mutations at this gene, the dihydrofolate reductase gene, and it's, these are none of the resistant mutations. This 111111 is a full house of resistant mutations. And look, out of all the possible permutations, 55% of them are one path. Why? Because that's the one that le causes the least trade-off, screws up the fewest other things. Okay? So I just want to give you this general idea that by analyzing the path by which resistance has arisen, we can perhaps attack it in a constructive way. This is a well-known image from evolutionary genetics. It's a fitness landscape. What does that mean? What this is, is the measure of how good a population is. So for, for a bacterium, this would be how resistant you are. Okay? And these are allele frequencies of two genes here. So it's just a simple model with two genes. Now, this is the highest fitness point, obviously. And what natural selection does, and you can show this formally, is it drive, if a population starts here, it'll drive it uphill. If a population starts up here, it'll drive it uphill. It drives it to the nearest hill. Okay? So the cool thing about this is, this is, remember fitness here is resistance to an antibiotic. This is the fitness of our bacterial population. This is maximum fitness. This is highly resistant. Okay? This is resistant, but it's not as resistant as that. Okay? The cool thing about how natural selection works is, it'll drive a population up to the nearest peak. If it starts here, it'll go up this peak. If it starts here, it'll go up this peak. Okay? Once it's reached a peak, natural selection keeps it there because it's actually deleterious to move down a peak. Natural selection is all about pushing up. All right? Now, think about this. This is just a thought experiment at the moment. But if we could devise regimes where instead of driving... Yeah, natural selection is going to happen, folks. But instead of driving it up to the high resistance peak, the uber peak, which is really going to create us problems and result in New York Hill figures premature demise, okay? We can drive it up to a lower peak. It's stuck there now, but it's less of a problem for us, okay? And in order to actually actuate this kind of analysis, we need that sort of pathway analysis that I showed you before. But two things to finish with, and I think these are both really cool, upbeat things, and it's all about this trade-off. It's a paper that came out last year. Um, this is about a bacterium, which is a leading... This is a bad thing. This is a, a leading fungal pathogen of humans. And there have been three classes over the years of antifungal antibiotics that have been used. Two of them are readily, readily uh, responded to by the bacterium... Uh, sorry, the, the fungus in terms of generating... Anti uh, antimicrobial resistance. So that's fine. You can, so far as candida is concerned, you can throw these stuff, triazoles and the echocandins. We can, we can deal, man. We can evolve. Interestingly, the other one, this thing, amphotericin B, which I guess AMB is a bit shorter, um, it's been used for a long time. There's no resistance to it. Why is that? Well, the thought is that it is such an embedded system that you can't mess with this. So the argument is um, 
that there's so many evolutionary constraints associated with the target of this antibiotic that you can't respond. If you respond, the trade-off is so big that you die, right, if you're a candidate. Okay? So the suggestion there, and this is the, the conclusion of this article, which is kind of, it's cool, I think it's really cool. Developing antibiotics that deliberately create such evolutionary constraints. An evolutionary constraint is trade-off. In other words, you mess with this, buddy, and you're dead anyway. So don't mess with it. Okay? Um, might offer a strategy for limiting the rapid emergence of drug resistance. My final slide is another I think really positive thing, and it relates to this trade-off idea. This is a study from the New England, well, yes, obviously, the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so, uh, as I told you about the history of malaria treatment, chloroquine was a big deal, started in the 1930s, uh, became increasingly ineffective. So this is in Malawi. In 1993, Malawi said, okay, chloroquine's done. We're going to use the new uh, sulfoxidine and pyrimethamine um, combo, okay? So we've stopped chloroquine because there's such high resistance. This is a study done 12 years later, published in 2006, in which they used chloroquine again. It worked fantastically well. So in 1993, it was pretty useless. 2005, it worked. So what's happened? Well, as with is this getting back to pleiotropy, folks, yeah, chloroquine resistance in plasmodium comes at a cost. There's a trade-off associated with it. So if you remove chloroquine, that resistance is going to be actively selected out of the population by natural selection because it's because the trade-off. Right? There's no reason to have that resistance. All it is is a handicap, a disadvantage because of the trade-off. Right? It's actively selected out of the population. So 12 years later, there's no chloroquine resistance. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us a, a beautiful lesson of, about trade-off. But true, it gives us a, a strategy for the future, which is smart, rotating use of antimicrobials. Okay? Given the fact that in the absence of active selection by the antimicrobial, the resistance will typically, courtesy trade-off, decline, then okay, we'll rest that one. Start with one. Resistance will evolve. Now we're going to rest that. Now resistance will be selected against while we're using molecule two. Then once two has develop resistance, maybe we go to three, and then once three is developed resistance, we go back to one, okay, by which time the population has forgotten all about the resistance in one. So, as I say, I, I think there is real hope in this idea of trade-off, and it's an idea which is, in a sense, an inevitability given the way in which genetic information is structured uh, with pleiotropy. Thank you very much, folks. I d what went on a bit, didn't he? <laughs> um, I mean, do you want to break up now or have a question? If anybody has a question, we should take some questions. John. So, so uh, the bacteria you showed first, uh, towards the beginning, where resistance developed in the caves, yeah. completely against this idea of uh, table. No, that's a very good point. Um, well, not necessarily. I mean, it could still be a trade-off, but if I'm living next door to a pernicious bacterium, I need to carry the burden of antibiotic resistance in order to deal with them. So it depends on the, quote, selection regime. But no, yours is a good point. Yes, it's, it's natural, so it, they must have solved it somehow. Yeah. Is there um, horizontal transfer among these? I mean, they In plasmodium? Yeah. Uh, I, d I don't know for sure, but I, I would be surprised. I mean, given that it's a complex eukaryote. So certainly much less. I mean, there's none swapping out cassettes of, uh, of, of plasmids or anything like that in these guys.
but then if you have these two peaks in your um, landscape, yep. the evolutionary landscape, what, why does it sort of this uh, horizontal transfer occur between these peaks? Maybe oh, we don't have it. The, the, the idea with that is that we don't actually have anyone on the big peak. Oh, I see. They're all gone. Well, they never got there. Okay. I mean, the point is, we're starting off with a, a flat landscape. The landscape is created by the application of the antibiotic. Okay. But instead of driving the population up there, we want to drive the population up there. And then it's very difficult to get because you, you have to go down in fitness in order to get up there.